All right, so as I mentioned in the announcements, I was going to be preaching on our giving. And, um, you know, I preached on tithing and, and things like that in the past. And I'm going to continue to preach on things like that. I'm not afraid to. Obviously, it's not the main focus, so it's not something you're going to hear on every week. Uh, unfortunately, like, like some churches do, that they're focused so much on the money that it's just always coming across the pulpit week after week after week after week. Uh, I don't, I don't want to do that with anything. Right? I want to be able to, to preach the whole counsel of God. And obviously, we're not a, a money-focused church. It's not all about the money here. And the Bible is not all about the money either. But that being said, you know, there, are, there is a considerable amount of Scripture that is dedicated to the concept of giving and supporting and helping, and you know, whether it be through the tithe and offering or whether it be through alms, whether it be through supporting the saints. There is quite a bit of Scripture. So for me, it would be negligent of me to just, to just not cover this stuff either. You know, maybe, and, and here's, here's the thing that, that preachers might be um, hesitant to preach on is because, oh, I don't want people to think I'm all about the money. Yeah, but you know what? It's an important subject still. So you got to preach on all of it. And people are going to think what they're going to think anyway. So, you know, we're preaching the Bible here. And what I want to show you is, is where our hearts and our minds should be at and because you know money is a very real thing it's part of our life it's part of our daily life you go to if you have a job you go to work you're earning money right it's a it's a it's a means of, of transfer of your your work and your labor to be able to allow you to uh you know purchase the other things that you need to be able to do trading uh with currency so the money that you spend and that you have is a reflection of the work that you've already done, right? It's a reflection of your, of your time and your effort and your energy put forward. So what we're going to see in the scripture here is that even though there's not some huge focus on your money and what you do, it, it you know, the Bible definitely talks a lot about helping other saints and helping other churches and, and people who are in need and especially being able to support missionaries and support men of God and doing the work that they're doing. Um, and the, the, you know, there's a lot of things I want to say and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's just start here in Philippians chapter 4. Jump down to verse number 14. I want to focus on this part of the passage first because there's, there's so much to this. And, you know, where, where you put your money and where you invest um, it makes you more into that. It makes you, you care a lot more about it, right? When, when you're, the, the more you, and it's not just money. When you, you know, when you invest more time, when you invest just, just more of yourself, whether it be through money, whether it be through time, you know, through your thoughts, through, you know, through everything else, the more invested you're going to be in those things. And you're going to care a lot more about them. And, you know, with the prayer challenge, the more you, you actually pray for other people, the more you're going to care about those people and be thinking about those people and then want to know, hey, what's going on with these people? I've been praying for them as opposed to just you see it once and then you don't think about it ever again, right? Well, it's similar with what you do with your finances, with your resources. How am I going to spend this? Now, obviously, everyone needs to spend some on on you know yourself on your family so, you know supplying your needs you know getting food and clothing and, and and that type of thing but also you know maybe hopefully you have other money to give as well now uh, everyone's in different situations financially and the Bible talks about that as well we're gonna see the scripture that talk about you know those uh, that can or cannot uh, give or supply right now everyone and I'm just gonna I, I don't have anything on tithing in here at all but uh, just so you know where we stand as a church, I 100% completely believe and, and uh, can prove that, that tithing is biblical even in the New Testament, that we are under the order of, even though we're not under the Levitical order, we're under the order of Melchizedek, and Melchizedek received tithes of Abraham, and he received tithes of Levi, being yet in the loins of his father. And you know the Bible teaches that over and over again. He received tithes. The tithe belongs to the Lord anyways. How the money was spent for the tithe was to support the Levitical priesthood. We don't have Levitical priesthood, but you know what? We still do have men of God. We still do have people dedicating their lives to serving the Lord. Now, they were offering sacrifices and serving the Lord in that manner, but they also taught the people as well, the priests and the Levites. So you have people that have a very, very, very similar job function as the Levites did, right? And they were supported, you know, through that tithe. Well, 
that hasn't changed. Okay, and I'm, I'm not going to preach, re-preach or preach that sermon right now, but um, that is something that is not optional because it's God's money. Okay, that's something that God demands or expects of you. But what I'm preaching about this morning, what I'll focus in on, is more, would be more of a considered in the Old Testament a free will offering or, you know, just any type of love offering to help other people out. And, that, and that's the scriptures we'll be focusing in on. And, and here's the thing, and, and just keep this in mind as we go through these passages, because some people will misuse many of these passages and start applying them to the tithe when the ones that we're going to be looking at this morning is not talking about the tithe. Because people will say, oh, you know, you, you don't have to give because God loves a cheerful giver. We're going to look at that passage as well. And they say, see, you don't have to feel compelled or anything like that. And they want to apply that to the tithe when that's not what it's talking about. Okay, so I'm not going to cover all those points because I really don't want to focus on the tithe at all any more than I just did right now. It's important for the groundwork, but going forward, I'm not. But as we go through this, make note of the passages and look them up later. If you, if you still have questions or doubts about, oh, well, the Bible says this or that about the tithe, look it up for yourself. All these passages we look up and see, is that really talking about the tithe or not? Okay, do your own study on it. And you can make note of them, get the full context later, and, and check it out for yourself. But that's all I want to spend on that. Let's look at verse number 14 in Philippians chapter 4. Bible reads, Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me, as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, the Apostle Paul here is he's he's you know praising the Macedonians, he's praising the Philippians, he's saying, you know, no one was even con basically concerned about the giving and receiving, but you guys. You guys, even when I left, you were checking up and seeing, you know, do you need anything? Are you okay? Do you, do you have what you need to keep doing your work? And he's praising them for this. And he's saying, you know what? I didn't desire a gift. It's not that he just wants to have a gift. Okay, on the one hand, you have people doing the work of God. You shouldn't be getting into the ministry and wanting to do work for the Lord because you're desiring a gift and going, oh man, I'm going to have these people now paying for all this, you know, that's not the point. It's your necessity. It's, 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 it's taking care of the needs that you have. I mean, think about it. When you travel, like the Apostle Paul is traveling all over the place, you have something called travel expenses because it's not free to just travel. Right? I mean, you, you, if, you're, if you're traveling, you're not like doing other work to earn money, right? When you travel, you have to, even if you're walking, you're going to have to stay somewhere. You're going to have to eat something. You're, you know, I mean, there, there's expenses that go along with that. And, and you can't just, um, you know, so you, so you can't just provide for yourself 100% while you're doing this other work and the work for the Lord. I mean, it just makes sense. So what he's saying here, he's saying, I don't desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, this is the mindset that we need to have and remember when you're giving to people who are doing the work of the Lord, when you're giving to people who are, who are, you know, winning souls to Christ, preaching the gospel, preaching the word of God, doing this stuff, what, what you're doing is you're facilitating and helping them to do that work. So because you're helping them to do that work, the fruit that they're bearing and the fruit that they're able to do and the work they're able to accomplish you actually get a benefit for that. And the top of my sermon is fruit on your account. And what he's saying here is, hey, look, I don't, it's not that I want the gift, but you get to partake in the work that I'm doing by helping me go and do this work, right? By, by being able to give and support the work that I'm doing, you have an account with God in heaven, right? We all have an account with God in heaven. And at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be judged according to our own works, right? We're going to receive rewards for that. But part of what you're going to receive for is when you give and to help other people further the gospel and further the work of the Lord. I do 100% believe that. Now, I think you'll, you'll, you'll probably get up more for the work that you do personally, but that there is going to be a reckoning and, and, a, and a, you know, some reward given for your help and service to the people who are out there 
to support them to continue doing what they're doing because I mean honestly you, you wouldn't be able to do it without having your needs supplied and we know that God supplies every need but you know what God's using people to supply that need and and you know sometimes it's miraculous right God's capable of anything we've seen that with Elijah and Elisha you know he's able to keep people through you know tough times and persecutions and things like that absolutely but God is, is also using and we're gonna see this you know um, the, the people and the, the brethren and the Saints to support other people in the ministry look at verse number 18 the Bible says but I have all in abound I am full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. He said, that's a good sacrifice. God accepts that. It's a good thing to sacrifice, to give unto, you know, unto me. He's like, I've received, I, I have everything I need. And he's basically saying, thank you. And, you know, I, I have all that I could have. And that, that sacrifice is, is sweet. It's acceptable unto the Lord. And it pleases God well. Verse number 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we see here this blessing from the Apostle Paul in a statement just saying that, hey, God's going to supply your needs. And when it comes to giving, yes, we all have needs, but... And turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And we're going to get to this passage later, but God truly loves a cheerful giver. And here, the way that you can be cheerful in giving is if you don't have your heart so set on your money. And, and you know, if you, if you can walk away with at least one thing this morning, this is a really important one. Because it gets to the heart of a lot of things. It gets to the heart of covetousness. It gets to the heart of self-centeredness. It gets to the heart of things where people get so focused on their own riches and their own money and just want to cling to that. You need to be able to, to learn to let go. And I'm not saying this because, oh, man, brother, you just want us to give you all of your, our money. You know, no, <laughs> it's not it at all. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin you if you have such a tight grip on your money and, and you're fine, and, and you know, it, it leads people to be really stingy and not free and liberal and generous, generous with what God has given to you. And we need to remember, you know, while yes, you may be working very hard and, and, and doing a lot and putting in a lot of time and hours, and, and, I, and you know, we ought to be hard workers, at the end of the day, still. God is the one who's, who's blessed you and given you the abilities that you have and has given you the opportunities that you have. And we need to, to recognize that, that everything that you have is by the grace and mercy of the Lord. That's right. Amen. Amen. And when we consider what God has given us as us being stewards of that, more than just owners of that that'll help you make decisions on what's going to be pleasing to God with what he's given you. Now I want to be clear I'm not talking about drawing a line between what's a sin and what's not. Okay? Because being generous and giving if you don't do that it's not a sin. Right? There's something like, like I would believe that if you're not tithing, that's a sin. Because I believe the Bible commands that. But the spirit that we ought to have as Christians towards brothers and sisters in Christ and towards workers of God and people doing the work is that we ought to be giving of our own free will to support those things. But if you weren't to do that, it's not a sin. And I think one of the reasons for that is because not everyone's in the same boat financially. Right? I mean, God's not going to demand of someone who really just doesn't, you know, they're struggling, they don't have very much at all to just, oh, well, you just have to give and give and give and give and give for all these people. It's like, well, I can't. I need to be able to just survive myself. But, um, and then, you know, I'm not going to get too deep into this either, but that also then requires you to prioritize your life and what really is important, what's a need versus what's a want. And when you're managing your finances, that's actually a very important thing to get yourself to understand you know, wh where the line is drawn for that. Because there's, overall, we're extremely wealthy 
the people who live in this country, even, even the quote unquote poor people are very wealthy in this country because our needs are much more than supplied um, to where we just have a lot of wants that, um, you know, and we, we don't want to focus on those things. But let, did I have you turn to 1 Corinthians 16? Here's, here's kind of how this plays out a little bit in church, and this is another passage that I'm bringing up. So the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 was saying, hey, look, you know, you, basically praising them and say, I want fruit to, to abound unto your account because you communicated with me, you're making sure that, that I have all my needs met and that God sees that as a great sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 16, now, now he's addressing the church at Corinth and he's basically addressing them to make a collection for the saints. It says in verse number one, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. So he's saying, hey, look, I told the church of Galatia to do this. Now I'm telling you to do this too, that we're taking up a collection for the saints. And this collection is different than giving your tithe, right? You give the tithe to support the local church, the organization, the way things are running there, the staff, everything that's going on at the church. This is a separate collection that he's saying that needs to be taken up out of the ordinary for the saints. He says, uh, verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. Right? So it's not one set amount you all have to give this much. He's saying, you know what? However God has blessed you, however you're, you're being prospered by the Lord, just set aside some to be able to give for the saints. He says that there be no gatherings when I come. He's basically saying, get all this stuff prepared in advance so that way when I show up, it's all ready to go. You can give me the, you know, whatever it is that you've been blessed with and, and, and I can take that over to the saints so we're not dealing with the just getting, you know, collecting everything when I show up. Verse number three says, and when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So he's saying, whoever you guys choose to bring the money to, that's fine because here's the saints in Jerusalem are the ones that need this money and that's where it's going to be going. So um, they take a collection for those saints and, and he brings, and he says here, bring your liberality. Now I know we live in a time where, where at least, you know, most rational people are going to be thinking that I don't want to be called a liberal, right? I don't want to be called a liberal because the liberals are, are, you know, socially liberals, which means they tolerate and accept and promote all kinds of wickedness and things like that. That's the way that, that our current culture uses that word. But the word is not a bad word. Okay, and like classical liberalism is a great thing. Being, being known as a liberal in God's eyes, as far as what the, how the Bible uses the word, is a good thing because liberal... I mean, it, it, it comes from the word, from the root of like liberty. It comes from being real free, right? Being open. Now, we don't want to be real free as to like free into getting into sin, which is how, how modern day liberals are, are more um, in, in line with. But this is talking about being liberal with your distribution, with, with what God has, has blessed you with to give unto other people. It's, it's being very open and free with, with how you're giving your money to, to other people, right? And not, and not being concerned about that and not being so focused on, oh man, this is going to hurt me so bad and everything else. Look, God doesn't even want you to give if you're going to have that type of an attitude. Amen. But we ought not to have that attitude. We ought to just be able to say, okay, well, whatever, you know, it's just money. It's just money. Amen. Flip over to chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So 1 Corinthians 16, we see, we see him just telling them, hey, here's how we're going to do it. You're going to take up the collection and we're going to send that off to Jerusalem, right? right? Early churches, very, very scriptural. This is a very scriptural practice. And, and I'm, I'm explaining and, and just making sure everyone's aware, you know, we're doing the same thing, well, similar thing, Okay. I decided to take the money that we're giving out of our general fund. So instead of taxing you more with taking up a special collection, which would have been very biblical to do, and which is, by the way, we've done this in the past as well. When we supported Pastor Fritz, we supported, um, uh, who was the other? Uh, Pastor Shelley? Pastor Anderson. Um, when, they've, when they've been attacked... Right when Pastor Fritz lost his job, we we you know we collected a love offering for him. We we made a special collection for him. When Pastor Anderson came and preached for us here, we 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 took up a special collection for them. You know for for taking the time out and for the travel expenses and for everything else that they do to come out here. So we did that for them. 
But since we've already been abounding in general with our funds here, I decided, you know what, I don't want to tax you any further, but we'll just be able to take that out of our general fund and send it over to them. Not a big deal. It's still scriptural for us as a church to be giving to them. Um, but this is the way that they did it. And part of the reason I was able to do that is because I'm not supported with a full-time salary from our church. So I use, I, I try to keep as much money as possible for the church to go back into the church use until the time where I am supported full time. So again, that's, a, that's the way that we did it. We're sending off some money to them and, and it's because of their obvious need that they have right now and because they're doing a great work for the Lord out there. They're preaching the gospel. They're being bold. They're in a fight against wicked people of this earth and, and they need support. So as you flip back to chapter number nine, look at verse number one, the Bible reads, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas? Now, He's straightening out some things about their concept about he, how the Apostle Paul should be as an apostle. And you know what? Even to this day, there's a lot of people out there that have their own weird ideas on what, you know, men of God who are either being an evangelist or a pastor, what they can and can't do, which is outside of Scripture. Even back then, what I, what I can infer from this is that people are thinking, oh, well, Apostle Paul can't be married. Because he just needs to focus on the work of the Lord and he shouldn't get married or anything like that. He's saying, look, I have power to get married. There's nothing that, that would preclude me from getting married. And this is like what the Catholic Church teaches. You know, the priest, oh, you can't be married. You have to be celibate and all this other nonsense that the Bible doesn't teach at all. Okay? He's like, I can get, look, the brethren of the Lord, talking about Jesus' half, you know, his siblings, his half-siblings were married. And Cephas, the apostle Peter, like, he was married and we read about that multiple times in Scripture. He's saying, look, I have power to get married too, if I want to. And he's talking about eating and drinking, like, like I, can, I can do these things. And then he says in verse number six, or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. Because they were working while they were ministering. They were working secular jobs. You know, the, the Apostle Paul as a tent maker was going around and working to support his own needs while he was preaching the gospel. And he's saying, don't I have the power to not work in that regard? Of course he does, because the Bible talks about the supplying of his wants and needs, which he already did accept in, in some cases, right? Depending on where he was, it probably wasn't necessarily even possible for him to work or whatever. But the point is that just because he chooses to work doesn't mean that that's the way it has to be done. And there's people today out there that are in this house church movement that will tell you, oh no, you know, the pastor has to have a job and he has to support himself and it's unbiblical to be supported by a church, all this other nonsense. Like, read the scripture. Okay? And I mean, just, just think about it. Doesn't it just make sense? Just a as, a, as a unified church that wants to do the most for the Lord, th if you just think about it, right? We all want the same thing. We all want the word of the Lord to sound forth. We want the most amount of people getting saved. We want the most amount of work being done. So if we were capable of employing somebody full time, so you don't even have to worry about going out. Well, I, I mean, I got to support my family, so I got to work. I got to do all this other stuff. Wouldn't we all want to have as many people staffed as possible to get all of that work done full time so they could focus 100% on the things of God? I, I know I would. And I'm not just saying this because, oh, well, you're the pastor, you just want to get paid by the church. Look, I want to have many people employed by this church to be able to do the work of God and to just do that much more for the Lord. And whether or not I'm standing here or I'm sitting there, I'm happily giving to support, to, to further that cause. Because that's what I want, would want. That's why I want, regardless of what side I'm, I'm on, which I'm, we're all on the same side here, right? But I mean, whether I'm, whether I'm back here behind this pulpit or I'm sitting in the pew. Because you know what? That's the same heart I had when I wasn't a pastor. It's not hard. It's not a difficult concept to grasp. Right? Hey, let's, let's pool our money together and support at least one person to be just full-time dedicated to the things of the Lord. 
That's what we're doing, and that's what we're talking about here. And in this case, we're, you know, we're also talking about, this is Apostle Paul just saying that he has power to forbear work, working, which I would have the same power as well. I could forbear working if I want to and just be completely supported by uh, the giving that's given here. And then he says in verse 7, and he likens this to a war. He says, who goeth a warfare any time in his own charges? You think about the, the countries of the world that, that have war, they're engaged in war. You don't, the countries don't tell people, okay, you know, we're going in this war and you have to fight, but you have to bring all your own guns and bring all your own ammo and bring all your own supplies and bring your own food and make sure that, you know, people in your family are sending you food while you're out on the front lines and fighting this battle. Nobody does that because it wouldn't happen and nobody's going to do, no one's going to do that. Right? They'd be like, no, I'm not going and doing that. It would be the governments that are saying, okay, well, we need to fight this war. We need to all come together. So here, you all come here and devote your time and energy and effort. And you're going to be focused on fighting this war and we're going to supply all the resources, your MREs, your, you know, your, your, your ammo, everything that you need to do this war. You say nobody goes to war at their own expense. It's being paid for by other people to go and, and do the fighting. And while we're not in a physical fight, we are in a spiritual fight. So those who are engaged in this spiritual battle are on the front lines. You know, we need to have other people saying, here, we're supporting you. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a good job. Amen. Keep fighting. We want you to fight the good fight. And if there's anything that we can do to help, that's what we're going to do. And in this case, we're talking about finances, right? It says, who planteth the vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof, or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock. So he's given all these various illustrations, right? I mean, if you, if you grow your own garden, he's like, who doesn't eat of what you're producing? Right? Who's not going to partake in that? Who's not going to, who's going to feed the flock? You have a flock of, of cows and goats, whatever, and you're not going to receive anything from that. You're not going to drink any of the milk or anything like that. That's ridiculous. And he says, verse 8, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? This is the New Testament, okay, referencing the Old Testament law as being applicable today in the New Testament. Right. So, this, so does this sound like something that would have been done away as a carnal ordinance is? And you, no. Not if, not if the Apostle Paul is referencing it in the New Testament saying, hey, even the law says this. Verse number nine, for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the, ox, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And now he's going to explain this passage. Say, why is he bringing up an ox? Doth God take care for oxen? He's saying, do you think that this is in the law because God's really concerned about the ox, like being able to eat corn? No. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. You know, a lot of people, well, that's your opinion. That's your interpretation. You know what? No doubt. Thus saith the Holy Ghost, right? That, that was the inspiration. That was the true author of the scripture anyways, using the Apostle Paul here to write, for our sakes, no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He's saying, we're out here doing this spiritual work. We're preaching the word of God. This is spiritual work that we're doing. Is it really that big of a deal if we get a little bit of money and, and food and, and, and housing for, for doing this work? I mean, aren't the spiritual things more important anyways than the carnal things? So who cares about the carnal things? This is, this is what he's teaching here. Verse number 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So, the reason that the Apostle Paul is using here is explaining why they're not accepting the, the support from these people. You know, they're, they're giving a good example on how to work hard, but they also just want to not have anyone even caught up in any of the money thing because these people, I mean, apparently probably would be. And everyone's a little bit different. And he was receiving of the Philippians just fine because they had the right heart and the right attitude, but there was a lot of problems in Corinth. And he's just thinking, you know what? I don't want the gospel to be hindered at all. So if this is what I have to do to just, to just get the gospel out more freely, if I just have to work and not even deal with this mess of, of trying to accept some money from you guys who's going to cause more problems anyways, then I'll just work. That's the attitude the Apostle Paul had. And that's the attitude of someone who just cares more or the most about the things of God 
than whether or not even his own carnal needs are met. I mean, now, now, he had the power to just demand and say, no, look, you guys have to take care of me because I'm here to help you. I'm here to serve you, but you need to take care of me in so doing. But he didn't use that power because he wants the, the message to be the primary focus and didn't want to have to fight some stupid battle over money. And honestly, you know, it's tax season coming up now. And, and you know, I'm not for any of the, the taxes that the government has on us, the income tax that you just, just by virtue of you making a living, that the government thinks they have the right to just take whatever they want out of your paycheck. I'm not for that, but you know what? I still pay the taxes because it's not the fight and the battle that I think that, that we ought to be concerned with. That's not what God is, you know, someone else can fight that battle and I'll be all for it, great, whatever. But, you know, as, as children of God, it's not worth prison time. It's not worth, you know, investing resources and time to fighting that battle over stupid, filthy lucre. Who cares? I mean, I don't like it any more than the next person, but, you know, I'm going to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. I'm going to still tithe unto the Lord. And you know what? When, when the tax man comes, just like they came, even if they're being wicked and, and, and unrighteous in their own laws, Jesus still sent the Peter to go out and, and, and catch that fish that had the money in its mouth and, and pay, the, you know, pay the, the wicked tax man that's extorting him or whatever. Anyways, that's a, that's a side track. I don't want to get off onto that, onto that uh, subject. Verse number 13, Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? So again, he's just, he's just saying, you know, people doing this work they're partaking of it, right? They're being supported. Turn if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I need to hurry up just a little bit. So Philippians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and now in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're also going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You're going to see how often this subject is being brought up of the men of God, and people of God being supported by, you know, carnally or physically supported financially by the saints, by people of other churches. Okay, by, by, by this, is, this is something that, that happens and needs to happen for more work to be done. Verse number 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. So even their, you know, their deep poverty it abounded under the riches of the liberality. So, he, I mean, he, he keeps bringing up the churches of Macedonia because, it, you know, for the work that they've done. And they're, they're actually a very good example set forward of their liberality and the blessings that they receive. It says in verse 3, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So this is, you know, this is how they're viewing or giving. It's fellowship, right? We're communing with you in fellowship to ministering, to helping the saints, other brothers and sisters in Christ who are doing work. Verse number five, and this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So was it God's will for them to get involved and, 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 jo and join themselves in this fellowship and giving and helping? Yes, it was. They gave of their own selves to the work that was going forward and, and cared enough about it to make sure that the needs, and, and, you know, the needs are met of those doing the work. Verse number six, In so much that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. So he's instructing them, using Macedonia as an example, saying abound just like they do, right? Now we're instructing you to be like them in this regard, in this giving, in this liberality, in this fellowship, in this ministry. 
Verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. You know, the, the giving is showing their, you know, that they really do care. That they really are sincere about what they say they love because they're putting some, you know, they're putting their money where their mouth is, essentially. Verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Again, this is the concept, this is the mindset to remember that Jesus Christ had all the riches and glory in all of creation in heaven. But what did he do for you? He came out of that glory. He came out of heaven and came to this earth humbly as, you know, as basically a poor, you know, into a poor family, which can be proven in scripture that, that they didn't have a lot of money when he was born. The offering that was given was, was two uh, young pigeons or turtle doves, which, which, you know, for giving a sacrifice for a child, it, it, they, did, they weren't able to give the lamb. They had to give the, the two birds demonstrating that they didn't have a lot of wealth. He came into a, a humble family. He humbled himself by giving up all of that for your sakes, for love, for you. Was willing to give up all of that for you that we ought to have that same mindset that we're not focused on the riches of this world that we may even become poor in this world to help others out and to give that ministry unto others that other people might be rich because we're focused on them. We're not focused on ourselves just gaining wealth. We're focused on helping others. That's the mindset. That's why we don't want to be so stuck on just retaining the physical goods of this world. Verse 10, And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. And again, this is, this is referring to, you know, not everyone has to give. So anyone, you, you know, we all ought to have a willing mind, but there's still only so much that, that people have to be able to give. And, and God understands that, and we understand, you know, and everyone understands that. He says in verse 13, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened. He's saying, I'm not trying to just put the whole burden and load on your shoulders that you just have to take care of everything. He says, But by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want and their abundance also may be a supply for your want that there may be equality. So basically, hey, if God's prospering you, God's blessing you, then use that to help supply someone else's lack and want and need because then, you know what, maybe there's going to be a time where you're in need and you're in supply and then things will be given unto you and then you'll be blessed and then you'll be helped out as well. And that there's an equality that way that, that people will not have any lack. Verse 15 says, As it is written, He that had gathered much had nothing over and he that had gathered little had no lack. And this is talking about the manna when God was supplying the needs or the wants of the children of Israel in the wilderness saying, you know what, everybody had what they needed. So the person who gathered a lot, the person who gathered little, they all, they, they all just had what they needed by God. They were all being supplied. And God wants this same spirit within the churches, among uh, brethren, to be able to supply the needs of others here. And that's, and that's what um, the mindset we ought to have. Chapter 9, let's flip over to chapter 9. Verse number one, the Bible reads, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is super superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. Lest haply, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. So keep in mind here, because I, I kind of switched. Uh, we went from 1 Corinthians 9 to 2 Corinthians 8. So the first letter he's writing to them, but it seems like as we read in the second letter that they've gotten things right in this regard. 
Because even in chapter 8, uh, and then especially in chapter 9 here, we're seeing the forwardness of their mind. He's saying, you know, he convinced them, yeah, we ought, to, we ought to be like this. We ought to have the Spirit. And he's basically telling them now to get their... Um, to get their giving or offerings ready so that, you know, since now that he's been bragging on them a little bit and, and, and showing other churches, oh man, these guys are doing great, they're, you know, they're real supportive, they're willing to, to give and to help, that he's saying, lest, uh, lest happily if they have messed only come with me and find you unprepared, we that we say not ye should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Like, we don't want to um, show up and then... What are you talking about? We don't have you know, we don't have anything for you. We can't we can't do anything for you. Then obviously that would turn into a shame. Verse number five says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And this also ties in with the you know, fruit being given to your account. Saying, you know what, when you sow sparingly, you can't expect to reap very much. Right? I mean, the thing about it this way, when you go out soul winning, the, the less time you go out soul winning, you can't expect to get very many people saved, the, the smaller and smaller amount of time you go out. But hey, the more you go out and the more seed you're spreading, the more you're preaching the word of God, the more you can expect to reap, the more you can expect to have done. Well, in a similar fashion, you know, with the giving, with supporting other people, when we support missionaries, when we support churches, when we support men of God, we support people doing a work. Hey, the less you're able to give, well, that's only going to get them so far. Right? So the more you're able to give, then um, you're going to be able to, you know, the more you're able to sow, the more you're able to reap. So the more you're going to be able to give to support, the more you're going to be able to um, have more fruit to your account. Because the more work's going to be getting done. Now, obviously, we need to be careful with who we're supporting. Right? We don't, and, and when you're giving your money, and look, I, I'm giving my hard-earned money too for, for missionaries and stuff like that. I want to see what's going on. I want to know the work that they're doing. I want to know that the, that the money that we work hard for, that, that we're spending our time getting, will actually go to someone doing work. Because that's what we want it doing. We don't want it going to people just to have some cush job and sit on the rear end and then preach a sermon once a week or whatever and not do anything you know, significant. I don't want to support that person. I want to support someone else who has the heart to minister and say, you know what, I want them going 100%, full speed ahead. And not concerned about, about you know, their lack or their want, that, that we can supply that need for them. And that's why we choose the, you know, the particular uh, missionaries that we support. Right now, it's Brother Matthew Stuckey. I mean, he's, he, I know him personally, and he's a very excellent worker. He's giving updates. He's always letting you know what's going on with his ministry out there and who they're reaching and all the work that they're doing. So we know the work's being done. I mean, to the best that we can, obviously, without being <laughs> literally physically there. But... Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that that money is going there. And you know what? You get, you get a benefit to that as well in God's economy. Verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And this is that passage. And look, we're talking about ministering to the saints, as verse number one said. This isn't the same as the tithe. And that's why people say, oh, see, you, you, you need to give with a cheerful heart and not of necessity. No, because this is a different giving. This isn't the same as the tithe. This is something that you give to minister unto saints. This is something you give so that uh, you know, other people can, can, can be sowing the seed of God, that you're supporting them. And you know what? Decide what you want to give. No one can tell you how much that should be. And God's not telling you how much that is. God's just saying, you know what? Whatever you purpose in your heart, give that. It's up to you. And, and let him give. And you know what? If you're going to give, don't do it grudgingly. Because you ought to be happy to support people doing the work. And if, you, and if, you, if you're not going to be happy over that, you know, you don't want to have a root of bitterness because you're so tied to your money and your finances that you can't give it away. Then don't start being bitter because you feel like, oh, I have to give. You know, no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't. You don't have to give. 
Decide for yourself whether or not you're going to. I'm up here showing you the scripture of the heart we ought to have, the ministering mindset, what Jesus did for us by humbling himself and making himself poor so that other people could be rich, so that we could have mansions in heaven. Jesus did that for you. Okay, so how much should we be holding on to our... It's, it's like the man that was forgiven of his debt. Remember the parable that Jesus Christ gave? There was the, the, the one man had this huge debt and his children were going to be sold and he was, you know, they're all going to become bondmen because he had his debt and he, and, he, and he fell down on his face before his Lord and said, you know, you know, give me some time. I'll pay back everything that I owe. And, and that, that master forgave him of the whole debt. And then when someone else had owed a lot less unto him, he was just like, no, you know, like you're going to pay me everything that you owe, that, that you owe me. He didn't have that right heart. And you know what? He ended up being punished as a result of that. And we need to remember all that was done for us and have that same spirit and that same heart. Now, obviously, giving money isn't the same as forgiving someone of, you know, of a debt like that. And, and, and I'm cross applying that. It's not the main application because then you could be like, Pastor Burson, it sounds like you're saying, well, we have to do this or else we're going to be punished because you don't. All right. So I'm, I'm making a secondary application of that parable. It's not the primary application, but it's, a, it's what I'm referring to is that, is that mindset, right? Of being kind of unthankful, right? We ought to be thankful with what God's blessed us with and be willing to give other people who are in need that haven't maybe been as blessed as you've been blessed to do a work and to focus on the work of God. So I, I, please don't take that the wrong way, that, that, that the parable application, because it's not the primary application of that parable. Just, just want to be clear about that. Um, so we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And, you know, the, this parenthetical two verses here, I think it's talking about God being able to supply the sufficiency of all of your needs. So if you decide to give, he's willing to, or he's able to, you know, he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown, right? So you giving gives a blessing on your work as well, right? You're, the, 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 the ministering that you're giving to the sower, the person out there doing the work, is also going to be, be, you know, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. That's the way God deals with this stuff, right? It's just, it's just a further blessing for you by your faith and giving. Verse number 11, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God, whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Turn, if you would, to chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I mean, over and over and over again, we're seeing these references in Scripture on giving, right? And giving to the saints. And I'm teaching on this, one, to give the explanation of why we're sending money off to another church, but two, for you to just think about it on your own and maybe in a light that you haven't thought about it before because many people might think, well, I'm doing my duty. I'm giving my tithe every week or whatever, you know, and, and, and that's what I'm supposed to do. And that is what you're supposed to do. But I want you just to be able to think too about, well, how are you spending your own resources? And if you have, especially if you have extra or whatever, right? If God's really blessed you a lot, um, what are you, you know, what are you doing with that? Where are you investing your time and resources into? You know, consider 
it doesn't even have to be through our church, just supporting other people doing the work. Right? Sending off donations. Do it or not. You know, what, people that you think are doing a great job, you, know, you can do it through a church. You can do it through our missions fund. Right? That's one way of, of being able to give and supply the want of the saints. Or when you see people who are you know, making a stand and, having, and being persecuted, send them something. Right? Because th these things don't come you know, free. It's, it doesn't come without a cost. Obviously, the, the persecution coming at First Works Baptist Church comes with a cost. Definitely comes with a cost. So we're going to help try to supply that need and that want. And I just would encourage you to have that mindset of being aware of, like, hey, if you know that there's, there's brethren in need somewhere, to, to take it upon yourself to give, but to give cheerfully, right? To be happy about being able to supply and say, hey, you know what? God's really blessed me in this area, so I'm going to help out this person or that person because... Why not? I mean, I, I, God's blessed me. I might as well be a blessing unto someone else. And, not, and, and also make sure I'm not just so focused on my own riches and the cares of this world, but I'm willing to, to give of myself. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 7, the Bible reads, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. Look at what he says in verse 8. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. So here he's kind of rebuking them a little bit, going like, I robbed other... Now, did he really rob them? No, but he was accepting some of the, you know, the money from other churches in order to do work for, for, for other people. He's saying, you know, I'm working for you. You ought to be, you ought to be you know, giving and, and, and being able to support me since I'm working for you. But he said, you know what? I, I, was, you know, I was taking, you know, accepting some, some, some money from other churches. And then he calls it wages wages because he was being reimbursed for the work that he was doing and you know that's not a dirty word there's nothing wrong with that of a man of God being receiving wages carnal wages physical wages here for the work that they're doing there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing unspiritual about that because you have to survive <laughs> you have to live you have to eat you have to you, know, you have to do these things right so so the work you're doing a good work you ought to get, receive wages for that work. Verse number nine, and when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. Again, he's re making reference to other people helping him in his needs. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Now, we're, well, let's just keep reading here. Verse number 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, what does all this mean? He's, he's talking to the church at Corinth and saying how you know, other people had to supply his want. And then he's saying, but you know what? I'm still not going to ask or receive anything of you. And I wouldn't have it any other way. And he's saying, why not? Because I don't love you? He said, God knows. He says, but what I do, and he explains why he's doing this. He says that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. There were people within the church that were trying to find something wrong to, to, with Apostle Paul and something to slander him with and something to tear him down with. And they're seeking an occasion against him. So he knows that they're going to try to seek an occasion. Oh, you're giving this money to them and try to slander his name and, and use that as if he's doing something wrong or something wicked, which is why he's had to explain so much in depth that there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with receiving the wages. There's nothing wrong. And the attitude and the mindset, you know, we spend a lot of our time in First and Second Corinthians because he has to teach them this because he's got children of the devil that have infiltrated and are starting to pollute the minds of the church there. Because he says that these are false apostles, deceitful workers that are trying to seek occasion against him and they're using this thing of money and money that he might be receiving of the church to pollute the minds of everyone around him. Say, oh man, you know, he's doing this and he's doing that. 
you know, it's, it's akin to what we've seen and, you know, the slander I've seen going on against Pastor Shelley. Oh, all the money, you know, and they focus on all this money and everything else. Now, look, I'm all for exposing wickedness and thing, you know, things that are, that are truly problems, right, problematic. And if people need to be marked and called out for, for you know, doing some, some wicked things with funds, that's one thing. But that wasn't the case here with him and you know I, I don't want to get too far into that but there are people who are going to use that oh you, he's getting paid and he's getting this and he's getting that from the church just to cause damage and cause harm and there's children of the devil that are out there trying to do that and so the apostle Paul took the, the approach of saying you know what I'm not even going to take anything then because I don't want to give them any occasion at all even though there's obviously nothing wrong going on and he's explaining why it's totally right and legitimate, he's just saying, you know what, I'm not going to give you that occasion. These people help support me, so they're going to support me. And even though they're not even getting the benefit from me directly, you know what is right for Macedonia to support them, support him, because now they're getting fruit on their account as opposed to the people of Corinth. And this is the mindset that we, that we need to have. Uh, for the last place I'll be turned, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We'll wrap it up right here. And this just goes back to God has blessed us all differently. Now, I think everyone ought to have the same mindset and, and not be, you know, not be stuck on focusing on money, not be, you know, so tight and stingy with your money but being liberal and willing to give and willing to help and, and being able to just let it go. Be like, you know what? God's blessed up, blessed us. God's blessed me. I'm going to help someone else. I'm going to be a blessing to someone else. And, and not just be so hard focused on having to keep everything, right? And care about the, the things of this world. But not everyone has been blessed in the same manner. It's a fact. And what we're going to see here in Romans chapter 12 is how God has give, given different gifts to people. And let's just read, sorry, in verse number four, the Bible says, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, right? Not everyone has the same exact job. So we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Look at this. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. This is he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So if God has blessed you with the ability to give, right? He's saying, here's how you do it. He that's going to give, because not everyone's going to be able to really give in a whole con congregation. I mean, it's just, it's just a fact. There'll be people who just are just not really capable of doing it just because they're, they're doing everything they can to survive, or whatever they can, it's going to be very minimal, right? Everyone could probably find something to give. And praise God for that, too. Right? Whatever it is that you're able to give, great. But, you know, the, the, the more significant amounts, the Bible says, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. And, you know, a part of this is going to be, is, you know, if you happen to be in a position where you do have a lot of money to give, do it with simplicity, you give it unto the, unto the church, unto the leaders, and let them distribute as is fit. And, you know, what would not be simplicity would be, okay, well, I'm going to give you this money, but you need to do this and this and this and try and to take control of the situation. That's not in simplicity. Start adding different rules and things and, and what you could do with it. You know, look, well, if you're going to give, just give in simplicity. And that's never been a problem here, but I'm just, you know, this is what the scripture is teaching that, that if you're going to give, give in simplicity. And you could see easily how that could happen, how someone might walk in and be like, I'm Daddy Warbucks and I've got all this money. And if I'm going to give anything to you, then you need to do this. And unfortunately, that creeps into a lot of churches as well. And you've got these deacon run churches where you've got, you've got these people that have been around forever and they have a lot of wealth and they give a lot of money to the church. And the pastor's being supported by them and he's worried about what might happen if he goes against what they say because it's going to hurt him financially. You know what? It's not right. If you're going to give, you give in simplicity. You either give or you don't give. And, and if you give, just like they did in Acts chapter 4, you know, people were selling land and, you know, and giving all this money 
to supply for the wants and the needs of other saints. And that's what they were doing. They're bringing forth. And people were making these big sacrifices and donations. And you know what they did? They laid it at the apostles' feet. When they brought their giving, they're like, okay, well, here you go. And then they made the distribution as they saw fit. It's doing it with simplicity. And then in verse number 13, of course, it says, distributing to the necessity of saints. Plenty of scripture on this subject, on being generous, on being hospitable, which I didn't even really get into hospitality, but distributing to this, the necessity of the saints is something that we ought to remember, right? It's something that, that we need to be aware of, have the right heart, have the right attitude. You're not forced to do it, okay? It's one of those things that's more ex kind of expected but not demanded, right? We're expected to have a right heart. We're expected to have a, a, a selfless attitude. We're expected to be you know, loving and giving of ourselves, you know, as Jesus was loving and giving of himself. So we're expected to have that, but it's not a forced commandment of, well, you have to give to this person or that person or whatever when they have need, but it, it ought to be done cheerfully. So hopefully that clears things up, and, and I'm pretty sure everyone here, you know, hopefully it wasn't even that Im important for people here, but uh, if it was, if that clears up any questions, then I'm happy about that. Let's, uh, let's borrow as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, well, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for how you've blessed us as a church, dear Lord, that, um, that we are in a place right now where, where you've allowed us to abound, and I pray that, that you would help use our supply for others lack, dear Lord, and that, and that you would um, just, just take what you've given us and, and use it for, to supply the wants of other people, Lord, that are doing your work as well. And uh, God, I pray that you would please just watch over our churches and protect us and, and Lord, help us for, to, to be protected from evil and, and help us to be bold and continue to do the work that you've set out for us, Lord. And God, I pray that you please help us all to have a, a mindset that we're not um, greedy or covetous or too focused on, on our physical goods, but that we can be uh, liberal and open to being able to supply the wants of anyone who's, who's serving you and, and doing your work, that we could have fruit that would abound unto our account. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.